Hello, this is our presentation on The Bride of Frankenstein, directed by James Well. So before we get started, I just kind of wanted to introduce the plot a little bit. So um, after recovering from injuries sustained by the mob attack upon himself and his creation, Dr. Frankenstein falls under the control of his former mentor, Dr. Pretorius, who insists the now chastened doctor resume with his experiments in creating new life. Meanwhile, the monster remains on the run from those who wish to destroy him without understanding that his intentions are generally good despite his lack of so socialization and self-control. Um, so this film acts as a sequel to the original Frankenstein film. It has the same actors and everything, um, although the content is not content that's found in the novel itself. Um, so I'm here to introduce um, a couple of the most important characters obviously starting with Victor himself. Um, actually, in this film, they changed his name to Henry because the writers felt that the name Victor was too sinister sinister and malicious for um, American audiences. Um, I'll talk a little bit more later about it and how that kind of shows what culture was like back then. Um, so the character of Victor, I'm going to refer to him as Victor for the sake of the presentation. Um, his intentions in this sequel are very similar to what we saw from him at, um, in the novel itself. He kind of has this God complex at the beginning. He wants to play God, create human life. Um, this quote from him that says, think of the power to create a man. And I did, I did it, I created a man. And who knows, in time, I could have trained him to do my will. I could have bred a race. I might even have found a secret of eternal life. So. That shows his intentions with creating the monster at first. He wanted to, um, you know, possibly breed a race, that kind of stuff. Um, that wasn't really his, specifically his intentions in the novel. It's a little bit different than what the novel was like, but um, overall it was still him wanting to play God. And just like the novel after his initial encounter with the monster, he seems to kind of reconsider his actions. Um, he sees the consequences and so now he's like hesitant to create the bride and he's actually he has to be like coerced into doing it in the end um and unlike the novel he gets to have what seems like a happy ending um him and elizabeth who are now married both survive um he watches his creations be destroyed as long as well as his um former mentor that was kind of evil <laughs> um yeah so speaking of former mentor we have dr pretorius he is a new addition to the film. He was not present in the novel. Um, they added him just for the sake of the movie. He is portrayed as the mad scientist stereotype, um, very heavily the mad scientist stereotype. He, um, you can see in the picture, he's he created like these like miniature humans and he emphasizes the fact that it wasn't done by science, but it was done by black magic, which is something they've definitely added into the film that wasn't in the novel. I found that kind of interesting. Um, and in the beginning, you can kind of see that Pretorius is similar to Frankenstein. He says the quote, it's one of the most well-known quotes from the film, to a new world of gods and monsters. Um, so obviously he's referring to him and Frankenstein, them being the gods, obviously creating the, the new life and the monsters, such as the monster of the bride. Um, that kind of shows in his intentions that it's more than just wanting that, <clears throat> the first creation of life, like he wants the glory, he wants to take it a step further. Um, and we can see the difference between the two men as the movie continues. You can kind of see that Pretorius takes his work a little too far. He lets his ego get the best of him. And um, he ends up with a much crueler fate than Frankenstein did. Uh, obviously, we're going to talk about the monster. Um, this portrayal of the monster is the most well-known of them. Um, it was the first portrayal of Frank Frankenstein's monster in film ever. Actually, the first movie was just Frankenstein, but the sequel, he's still played by Boris Karloff. Um, it's the one we see the most in popular culture, the large towered man, sickly skin, large square forehead, very monstrous. Um, however, this version of the monster differs greatly from like the one that we see in the novel. For most of the movie, he lacks all ability to, all ability to communicate and um, so he can't speak, he speaks mostly, mostly just using like gestures and grunting. Um, even by the end, he's only speaking in like short broken sentences. Um, it's definitely a lot different than the monster we see in the novel where he's speaking fluent English and can read and everything like that. Um, 
and then I think this is his more, most important quote where he says, yes, I know, made me from dead. I love date, dead, hate living. That was in reference to him um, talking about Frankenstein um, to Dr. Pretorius. And it's something that's kind of recurring in this film. He mentions more than once that he feels like he should never have been born. Um, him and the bride, actually. Um, and he kind of just emphasizes that he feels like he doesn't belong and that um, he doesn't think he should have existed, basically. Um, and that notion's kind of the downfall. It is the downfall of him and the bride and Dr. Pretorius. Um, <clears throat> the end, the very finale, like the finale of the movie is him saying that they're better off dead. And then he blows up the tower with the three of them inside and they seemingly die. We don't know, but. <laughs> The Bride, the namesake of the movie. Um, I think she's a really interesting character. She's played by actress Elsa Lanchester, um, which I, th I think it's important to note that she also, that actress also plays the role of Mary Shelley at the beginning of the film. Um, and this quote I think is really interesting. It says, Shelley allegedly intended to include the bride in the original book of Frankenstein. So therefore mirroring the bride in the author's image helped demonstrate how, to, how the seemingly sweet and innocent could harbor wicked thoughts. And I think that's kind of ties into a lot of what we talk about in class and how women are either portrayed on one, under, one end of the spectrum or the other, either really sweet and kind and naive, stupid, or wicked and evil and monstrous. Um, so I just thought um, it was definitely a creative choice. It wasn't just because they needed an extra person to play Mary Shelley. They did it intending to um, depict this um, idea. Um, I also think it's important to note that even though they're created in the same way, her and the monster, the bride is not depicted nearly as hideous or unappealing. She's depicted actually as like pretty beautiful. Um, there's definitely a big distance between her and the original monster and how they're portrayed physically. Um, and I think that's kind of telling of how women are shown in film, especially at that time. Um, and despite being the movie's namesake, the bride has almost no screen time at all. She's only at the very end of the film and no lines whatsoever. So she only grunts and screams and that's it. Um, and then <laughs> immediately dies. And I think her character raises a lot of questions about the portrayal of women in Mary Shelley's novel and subsequent films. Um, like I said, there's definitely the, the disconnect between um, monstrous women and like this the young beautiful naive woman which we see in other characters in the movie and also just that difference between her and the character of Mary Shelley. Um, so some notable characters we have the blind man um, it's definitely a reference to DeLacy but he's not exactly the same. Um, he doesn't have a family he is a blind man he still plays the violin but he lives alone and he mentions more than once that he's blessed that the that the monster came and found him and that he was no longer lonely and that he had a friend and um he's a very pivotal role in the film he is the one that teaches the monster to communicate with other than just grunting and gestures he teaches them how to speak a little bit um and he's the first person to ever show him like any sort of empathy or any love which i think gives the monster a little bit more emotional intelligence than he would have had um we have lord byron mary and percy shelley um they're right at the beginning of the film um, I think they're used more of just like a plot device, like as a tool to explain how this part of the movie came about because like the bride wasn't in, the bride at all wasn't in the original novel. Um, so like the beginning is basically just Mary Shelley talking about the success of the first Frankenstein novel and her explaining that she always wanted the bride to be a part of it. So this is her telling the story of the bride, even though it wasn't originally in the novel. Of course we have Elizabeth, she's still in the film. Um, she has, she's not in it, she's not very prominent in the film, but um, she is a bit different than the novel's depiction of her. She's kind of like the voice of reason to Victor in this film. Um, he talks about, after that first quote that I read you from him, um, she insists that everything he's saying is blasphemous and he shouldn't be saying it. And basically that she was disgusted by what Victor had created. And he sees that and it kind of gives him that change of heart and it makes him realize what he's doing is wrong. She's also used as a bargaining chip later in the movie um, by Dr. Pretorius. He has her kidnapped and um, used um, to force Victor to 
create the bride even like against his will because um or else elizabeth would have been killed and she does get a happy ending as well she does survive the film um but i think she's another great depiction of how women are just kind of used as like objects as opposed to being their own person in this film and then we have minnie um she's just a townswoman she doesn't really play a important role in the film but she is like i think she was important to mention um she's depicted as like a crazy woman she's like the boy who cried wolf basically she's crying to the townspeople that the monsters come back and that he's alive and that he's coming to the town um and she's always met with men telling her to shut up basically and it's used as like the comedic relief in the film but i think it's um very telling of how women are treated especially ones that aren't considered like conventionally attractive she's an older woman more of like a witchy character than anybody else in the film and she's met with just criticism all the time nobody ever believed her um and then i also wanted to talk about the culture and the politics and what the film um tells us about the time in which it was made it was filmed in 1935 um so obviously it was being met with a much more conservative crowd than it would be met with today um, so they had to be very careful with what it was they were showing in the film. And these first two quotes, I think, are very telling of that. It says that they insisted on a less revealing costume for the mate, a reduction in the number of murders depicted, and the removal of a scene in which the monster attempts to rescue a figure of Christ on a cross. Censors in other countries took issue with the scene in which the monster looks lovingly upon the body of his theretofore unanimated mate, fearing that the scene could be interpreted as an endorsement of necrophilia. We also have by the time of Frankenstein or by the time Bride of Frankenstein made it to the big screen in 1935, a total of 15 minutes had been sliced from the director's running time, including a number of religious references that censors deemed blasphemous and inflammatory or possible for such interpretation. So obviously, um, when filming the movie, they had to be very careful with what they were showing because the crowds were um, they did not take kindly to um things deemed wrong such as murder or revealing costumes obviously she had to be um very um covered up because people didn't want to see that in theaters i guess and also this kind of goes along with what i mentioned at first how they changed his name from victor to um henry just because they thought it would make him too sinister um i think that's really really telling of like the reception of films back then and how something as small as just a name could be deemed wrong and needed changed. Um, and this last quote here, I think is one of the most important parts. Um, and I think Kate talks about this a little bit later in the um, presentation, but I think it's important to mention now. It says, make no, make no mistake about it. This is a politically conscious film that deals with a variety of highly controversial themes and addresses complex social, racial, gender, and sexual anxieties. So obviously that goes along with a lot of what we talk about in this class, the anxieties about people's bodies, especially women. Um, I do think it's important to add that the director of the film, James Whale, was an openly gay man, which was very unheard of for the time. It was 1935. People were incredibly conservative about that kind of stuff. It was, it was not legal, um, but he was open about it. So a lot of people felt that this film was him was his way of like spreading this um, homosexual propaganda and these themes, um, which I think it does. There is some sort of subtext there, but I don't think it was, um, obviously it wasn't as bad as everybody made it out to be. But I did think that was something interesting to add, um, especially about the public reception of the film. Okay, so here are the main differences between the novel and the film. So um, in the film, the film follows Henry Frankenstein and not Victor. So in the film, Victor is completely out of the question. Um, so this means that Henry is now the one that is married to Elizabeth. And this also means that um, in the film, Henry doesn't have this best friend figure like Victor did in the novel. So we also are introduced to Dr. Vittorius. So he is one of the professors that was at Henry's university. So um, this contrasts Dr. Kremp and Dr. Um, Waldman in the novel. And one of the main differences here with Dr. Vittorius is that Dr. Vittorius is one of the ones that helps Henry with this creation of this new monster. So um, he has assistance in this creation, whereas in the novel, Victor did it alone. He put himself in isolation and created the monster by himself. 
and Dr. Torius to show that he was able to help with this creation of life. He presented to Henry his tiny jar experiments. So these are tiny jars where he had um, miniature people. And uh, so some examples, like he had a ballerina in a jar, he had a king and a queen in a jar. And um, in the film, this is described as being seen as black magic. These were forms of black magic, results of black magic. Whereas in the novel, like the only source of unnatural creation was from the um, parts of dead bodies. And um, so this emphasis on black magic also can be tied to a connotation of evil. And the monster is accepted by somebody in the film. So in the novel, just everyone was able to see how um, gruesome and hideous and fear, like thrilling this monster was. And um, in the film, while he is stumbling through the stumbling through the woods to get away from these people that were trying to catch him he stumbles into this blind man's home and so the blind man decides to befriend the monster because he knows that they are both of a deficit so he notices that frankenstein cannot talk so he knows that his new companion now has a deficit of speaking and obviously the blind man himself has the blind has the deficit of seeing so that's what bonds them together and um this shows that even though he cannot see the monster. This is what helps him befriend him because he knows that he has a loving personality and a personality that's opening to open to becoming friends with someone. And sadly, this is ruined once um, those who are trying to capture the monster stumble into the home and it catches a blaze. So at the very end of the film, um, this is after the bride was created and um, the bride is also repulsed by the monster. And um, the monster's just distraught and stumbles upon the lever where if he pulled it, it would set the whole building ablaze and um, as Dr. Victoria says, blow them to pieces. And um, in this instance, he tells Henry and Elizabeth to get out because he wants them to live, which I'll get into in the next slide. So why are these differences important? So um, like I mentioned before, in the film, Henry has no best friend figure like Victor did which means um, he is more inclined, or I guess um, more willing to create these monsters. So he, the only one that he can actually confide in is his wife, who was later put into danger to, um, to help aid the creation, to help aid the speed of creation of the Bride of Frankenstein. So um, not just one person is responsible for the monster this time. So um, in the novel, the only person that would have been tied to the creation of the monster was Victor, whereas in the film, um, Dr. Pretorius aids in the creation of the monster, the Bride of Frankenstein. Um, so it's not just Henry working on this monster, which means that Henry is not the one mainly responsible for the monster. Uh, so the reason why he's not the main one responsible is because in the film, uh, Dr. Pretorius actually forces Henry into making the Bride of Frankenstein. And um, as, a, um, as a motive for Henry's creation of the Bride of Frankenstein, he decides to keep Elizabeth captivated, if, if that's the word I wanna use, captivated. He decides to take Elizabeth away. And um, that's the only motive that Henry had because he originally didn't want to create the Bride of Frankenstein, but Dr. Pretorius was the one that um, gave him the motivation. And um, so the film also puts the emphasis on the unnatural creation. So that's the um, part with the black magic. And usually black magic is tied to like witchiness and, you know, the old, decrepit, witchy women. Um, and it's really interesting for the film to put emphasis on black magic because um, in a way, Henry and Dr. Torius are also mother figures and in creating life, they are creating life, but of unnatural creation. So um, like I said before in the novel, the main source of the unnatural creation was just taking dead bodies, the parts of dead bodies and creating them that way, whereas, um, the film puts emphasis on that for the monsters and then also black magic with the um, tiny jar experiments. So 
The monster's acceptance deline delineates that it's not just his personality that make that that it's not his pers personality that makes him a pariah. So, um, since the blind man was able to accept the monster, like this shows that he has the sensitivity and emotion of being able to be be um, friends with someone or be companions with someone. And um, it's kind of like the uh, theme that everyone learns whenever they're in elementary school with the don't judge a book by its cover, but it holds up through time and it's still present in Frankenstein. And it honestly shows that uh, the monster has the capability of loving someone. And it's not just, it's not his personality that makes him the pariah, it's just the unfortunate appearance that he had to take on because of his creator. And uh, lastly, the monster truly wants the evil soul to die. So this is where he tells Henry and Elizabeth to escape so that he can kill both him and Dr. Pretorius. Because um, in one perspective, you could see the monster as the monster, uh, Henry's creation as the monster. Whereas you could also see Dr. Pretorius as the monster because um, Henry's creation, the monster, he had all of his hope riding in the creation of the Bride of Frankenstein because everyone else was rejecting him or was taken away from him, like in the blind man's case. But um, basically everyone that can see him was rejecting him. And the one being that would have been of the same like unnatural creation of the same circumstance that he was also rejected him. And that was in part... Uh, Dr. Pretorius's responsibility, that's his fault because he was the one that forced this creation to happen and put the monster's hopes into this creation of having a companion. So um, since Dr. Pretorius takes this responsibility, he is truly seen as the monster and truly seen as evil. And this is why both of them die in the end. Considering this movie was released in 1935, this movie does a wonderful job with the makeup of the monster and his bride. The makeup is done so the skin on their faces appear pulled taut, particularly on the forehead. The seams of stitching are visible, contributing to the gruesome surgical reminder of how the monsters were constructed from bits of other corpses. Here are some pictures of the monster and his beautiful bride. Uh, the monster particularly has a gruesome forehead where you can see, you know, the staples and screws in his neck, etc. And the female has very prominent surgical uh, lines on her jaw. Oftentimes in the novel Frankenstein, the scenery matches Frankenstein's mood. This film includes settings that create very ominous, dismal atmospheres. A persistent black and comfortless sky is seen throughout the film. Flickering lights and playing shadows often contribute to spooky scenes as well. The rain and lightning outside the big windows at the Gothic castle sets a perfect opening scene for Mary Shelley to begin her spooky tale. Candles also contribute to this effect. For example, when the creepy Dr. Pretorius makes his first appearance, shadows dance all around him which is perfect for the man who desires to, quote, probe the mysteries of life and death. And down on the left, you can see Dr. Pretorius. The laboratory. Props used to create the lab setting are particularly good in this film. The gleaming surgical instruments are quite blood chilling, as well as the young, fresh heart beating in a liquid solution. The electrical sparks used while they harness the energy to give the female creature life adds to the suspense of the scene. This lab scene helps capture the horror and revolting nature of Frankenstein's experiment. The creepy crypt and the stealing of bodies is also blood curdling. Down below you have Frankenstein and Dr. Pretorius keeping the beating heart going in this liquid solution how they represented the monster's brute strength in the film. So the movie begins with a scene of a large crowd gathered around a burning mill that the monster is supposedly trapped in. Uh, he does escape, showing the unnatural strength and build he has. The mob that chases the monster shows how relentless men are to kill him. They also attempt to trap him in a, in a cellar and shackle his body to a large chair. 
the monster dramatically breaks free once more, and the breaking of the shackles is symbolic of how his body defies reason, nature, and authority. And to the right, you see how dramatic the scene truly is when he breaks these chains because they are huge. The element of fire is used throughout the film to represent the monster's fear and distrust towards men. The monster is constantly seen enduring brutality and violence. Mobs of men chase him with spears and torches whenever he is discovered. When the monster encounters the blind man, he flinches from fire repeatedly out of fear, like the fire that the blind man cooks with, for example. This scene and his visible recoil from fire helps capture the section of the novel where the monster is beginning to despair from his overwhelming loneliness and the formation of his intense hatred for mankind. And the kindness he encounters with the blind man is short-lived when he is discovered yet again. And honestly, I think him recoiling from the flames of, you know, the blind man offering him a lighted cigar, for example, it re- this scene really does build uh, some compassion for the creature just because you know what he's encountered. So the scenes of the monster ambling through the woods alone is set in a very idyllic, peaceful forest. And when he looks at his own reflection in a stream, he recoils in anger and loathing. And this scene was captured very well. And the contrast of the beauty all around him helps visually show how out of place in the natural world he truly seems. And down on the left, there is a picture of him in the woods And there's also a young maiden in the scene who uh, drowns for a moment. To the right, I included this picture of the angry mob with the fire from the mill in the opening scene, just to kind of show the sharp contrast of like the destruction that follows him. Like whenever he finds peace, this mob uh, quickly finds him as well, even in places like this peaceful idyllic wood. Costumes of the Bride, my favorite. So when she is first created, she's wrapped up in linen like a mummy, as you can see below to the left. Unveiling the bandage around her eyes reveals her eyes underneath wide open. So this dramatically sets the scene for her first moments of life and adds to the anticipation and suspense of the audience greatly. And when she first lays eyes on Frankenstein and the monster, she's wearing a long white gown. This is symbolic of the union that she is supposed to form with the male monster, like a type of wedding ceremony, perhaps. One thing that the viewer gains a deeper understanding of in The Bride of Frankenstein is the viewers are provided with a clear depiction of the parallels between Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and the creation of the monster's bride. The addition of the character Dr. Pretorius draws specific attention to the connection to the fall of man because he represents Satan, tempting Victor to get back into the scientific practices that created immense destruction, chaos, and death upon his first time diving too deep into science and creation of the monster. Early on in this movie, Elizabeth warns Victor about the dangers of thinking that he can do what only God can. This is interesting because in the movie, Elizabeth, the woman character, is a voice of reason and sensibility. Having seen the hardship caused not only to Victor's mental and physical state, but also society as a whole, she warns him about becoming too consumed and isolated in his work again. Moreover, in this film adaptation, we see Dr. Pretorius magnifies the connection to Adam and Eve because he acts as Satan tempting Victor. In the biblical text, when talking about eating the forbidden fruit in the garden, Satan says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing God, knowing good and evil. Dr. Pretorius knows Victor's obsession with knowledge and uses this against him to fulfill his own agenda. Yet regardless of the male character representing Satan in this film, it is interesting to note that when with creation of Frankenstein's Bride at the end of the movie, that is when the height of the destruction reaches its peak. And similarly in the biblical story, when Eve comes into contact with Satan, that is when man falls. We will now watch a short clip um, that I think will be helpful to further our class's understanding. So let's see if this will work. Um, Sorry, everyone. Okay. 
This isn't science. It's more like black magic. You think I'm mad. Perhaps I am. But listen, Henry Frankenstein, while you were digging in your graves, piecing together dead tissues, I, my dear pupil, went for my material to the source of life. I grew my creatures, like cultures. Grew them as nature does, from seed. But still, you did achieve results that I have missed. Now think, what a world-astounding collaboration we should be. You and I, together. No. No, no, no. Leave the charnel house and follow the lead of nature. Or of God, if you like your Bible stories. Male and female created he them. Be fruitful and multiply. Create a race, a man-made race upon the face of the earth. Why not? I don't. I don't even think of such a thing. Our mad dream is only half realized. Alone, you have created a man. Now, together, we will create his mate. You mean, yes, a woman. That should be really interesting. All right. Finally, at the end of the movie, ultimately, um, the ending reveals the consequences of breaking set boundaries. While Adam and Eve now pave the way for broken humanity due to their disobedience and the entrance of sin, the monster concludes, you stay, we deserve to die, meaning that he, the bride, and Dr. Pretorius deserve death. The monster then pulls the lever in the lab to blow up the building. Therefore, the movie ends with more death and destruction. Hence, communicating the idea that when man tries to become God and steps outside of the boundaries of their human capabilities, the result is incredibly harmful. This movie also has lots of Im imagery that tends to focus more on the life of the monster rather than Victor. This movie helped me to have a deeper understanding of why the monster acted in the way he did, and this film creates a sense of empathy and compassion for the monster despite his actions. Although a stretch, the movie subtly depicts Frank, not Frankenstein, Frankenstein's creation, the monster, as a Jesus-like figure um, by showing his rejection from society and the way that he was persecuted by many. Just as Jesus was made in the likeness of men, so was the monster, both being immensely persecuted by their own people. This also relates to our discussion we had earlier in lecture about whether the monster is more like a human or a monster. Um, and this movie provides evidence for why the monster would be more human-like. An interest, interesting secondary source that I found was an essay published by Michael Eberly Sinatra at the University of Montreal um, titled Readings of Homosexuality in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and Four Film Adaptations. Reading this essay paired with the prior knowledge that this movie repeatedly comments on stereotypical Christian values is very interesting to analyze the way that um, director James Well changed his 1935 movie. In Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, there's lots of ambigu ambiguity surrounding Victor and his passions for Elizabeth. Victor is so consumed with love and fascination for the creature he had created that he misses the very clear hint and statement the monster made about visiting him and Elizabeth on their wedding night. In addition, in Mary Shelley's edition of um, this story, Victor spends a majority of his time with his best friend, Clerval, and seemingly has more love for him than Elizabeth. The author of this essay notes that, indeed, the films never seem to question Victor's sexuality, but on the contrary, repeatedly emphasize his heterosexuality whereas the novel leaves this aspect of Victor's character more open to discussion. The novel's Victor is obsessed with the creature who repeatedly makes his pulse beat faster and his brow sweat. For instance, in the original novel, Victor declares, I remembered also the nervous fever with which I had been seized just at the time that I dated my creation. The change made to the movie 
deepened my understanding and helped me to see more clearly the underlying hints of homosexuality between Victor and the other male characters in the original text, especially the monster. The author of this essay also states that Wales 1935 film offers the creature a female companion, if only for a limited time, when in the novel, Victor destroys the female creature he was working on, thus eliminating any potential heterosexual competition for the creature's attention. Overall, reading these secondary sources and reviews of the film has deepened my knowledge and helped me to hone in on viewing the film with a more critical lens and um, uncovering subtle hints of homosexuality in Mary Shelley's original edition that I would not have noticed hadn't it been for these secondary sources and critical essays. So yes, I hope you guys enjoyed our presentation and get a chance to watch James Whale's 1935 um, film adaptation of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So thank you for listening to our presentation.